Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, we're happy to welcome you to this evening's uh, conversation on charitable writing. Uh, we were talking beforehand about just uh, in a uh, time where it just seems like there's so much rancor in a lot of our communications written and spoken, uh, that this is an important subject for us to consider. And uh, uh, my name is Bob Truby. I serve as the director of uh, InterVarsity's Emerging Scholars Network. Um, and uh, uh, just a few things before we get started here. One is that we do wanna let you know that we're recording today's event. Uh, uh, if you prefer not to be recorded or photographed, uh, please uh, mute your mic and disable your video. Uh, by continuing to participate in the ESN conversation with your video and or audio enabled after the, our recording begins, you consent to allow InterVarsity to use the recording and any screenshots of our conversation for InterVarsity ministry purposes, including posting a video recording online for asynchronous viewing. I'm gonna stop recording now to allow you to disobey, uh, disable your video uh, and audio if you'd prefer not to be recorded. We actually have everybody on mute, so you just have to do your video. Uh, just want to introduce our two speakers for tonight and then we'll get into it together. Uh, James Edward Beitler III uh, received his doctorate from the University of Michigan. Uh, he's an associate professor of English at Wheaton College, where he's the director of the first year writing program and also coordinates the writing fellows program. He's the author of Seasoned Speech, Rhetoric in the Life of the Church, and Remaking Transitional Justice in the United States, the rhetorical authorization of the Greensboro Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, Richard Hughes Gibson, uh, is Associate Professor of uh, English at Wheaton College. He's the professor of, uh, he's the author of Forgiveness in Victorian Literature, Grammar, Narrative, and Community. Uh, with designer Jeremy Botts, he co-directs Manibus Press, an occasional publisher of artist books. So with that, we're gonna get into our interview time together. And uh, uh, so uh, to begin with, I, th I thought one of the things we might do together is just talk a little bit about how the two of you wrote this book and how you came to collaborate on the project. James, can I begin? Yeah, begin. Um, so th the book has been brewing for a long time, um, although we didn't really start we didn't sit down to start writing together until 2017. Um, when I arrived at Wheaton, um, I became friends with Alan Jacobs, the distinguished chair of humanities at Baylor now. Alan had an office next to mine. Um, and he shared a copy of his book, A Theology of Reading the Hermeneutics of Love, which, which just profoundly reshaped my understanding of my responsibilities as a literary critic, as a teacher of reading. Um, and Alan's provocative claim in that book is that the double love commandment ought to shape our reading practices, which maybe it seems kind of obvious now, but coming out of my doctoral program in which I had learned all kinds of fancy theoretical concepts um, and, and various kinds of resistant reading practices, the idea that I ought to be loving the text and moreover loving the text in honor of my Lord was, was really strange. I mean, it threw me for a loop in a lot of ways. And thankfully I had Alan to converse with and um, ultimately altered my pedagogical practices. And I, I think my writing career for the good. Um, at the time, I was also teaching a lot of freshman composition courses. Um, and I, I sensed that my freshman composition courses needed to be recreated in light of Alan's discoveries. Um, and we might talk a little bit more about it later. Alan's got a particular reading of Augustine that's really important in this light, but I don't wanna get into the weeds on that just yet. And then Jim interviewed at, uh, for a job in our department and um, over dinner, or actually it was right after dinner one night, I, said, I, I pulled Jim aside and I told him that we needed to, to, to um, write 
charitable writing and um, Jim, who of course was in the middle of an interview process and wasn't quite sure who I was said, yeah, yeah, that sounds nice. Um, <laughs> uh, Cause I, I recognized that Jim had expertise as a rhetorician that I didn't. Um, and that mostly what I was gonna bring to the project was enthusiasm and some insights gleaned from Alan that uh, really Jim already knew cause Alan was his teacher. So um, I, I then, uh, saw that a sabbatical was coming up and I made the pitch again to Jim. I said, Jim, our sabbatical's coming up. Now's the time to write the book. And Jim said, yeah, yeah. And then finally agreed to do it. And that's how the book came into being. <laughs> Jim, Jim allowed me to tag along and then somehow my <laughs> name ended up first on the, on, the, on the cover page. I'm not sure how that happened. Hmm. Yeah, that's mostly true. That's mostly true. No, I'm, <laughs> it's all true. Um, so yeah, so, and, and I had encountered Alan's uh, book on reading and love during my undergraduate years. And so it just, it just seemed like a natural extension uh, for mm. us uh, to basically go from um, the Shema to what Jesus says to Augustine. Alan took that um, and applied it to reading, all reading, not just scripture mm -hmm. as Augustine does. And it seemed like a natural extension of that to take it into the of writing, uh, which was uh, what my, my background is. I've got a PhD in rhetoric and composition. Um, so yeah, that's how it kind of came together. And then we started working on the pro project together and it was, it was a long process. We, uh, we had a lot of conversations about what the book ought to look like. Mm. And we, went, we went back to the drawing board several times over the initial months of writing, writing the project, but it, it, it emerged over time. Hmm. Well, well, Jim, you mentioned what the book ought to look like. And, in, and one of the interesting things about this book is there's an awful lot of art in the book for a book on writing. Uh, you know, it'd be interesting. Why, don't, why don't you guys talk a little bit about that and the, and, uh, the connection between those two media for you? Rick, do you want me to go first? Well, I, I'm wondering, do you have any of the images handy, Jim? Um, I've got the book here. Oh. Uh. Well, I guess we could we could just quickly show one of the, the pictures, but we actually had original art made for the book. Um, uh, I'll, sh and, I'll show that one. And Jim Jim, Jim spent al almost a month of his professional life getting permissions. Um, <laughs> so so this I, is an icon of Augustine that we had um, made for the book, uh, which is actually based on another another icon. Um, but yeah, we. Uh, the, the book did not originally have pictures in it. Um, and at some point, Richard, you were, you were searching for images and found this image of, um, by, by Benedetto de Bindo, right? Benedetto de Bindo. Yeah, so, and, that, and that's really when the book became, became a picture book. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that, Rick? Yeah, so when, when, we, when we drafted the proposal for the book, we had planned to take a primarily doctrinal approach. So there were gonna be sections about creation, um, sections about the creeds. And we were imagining those ancient documents and doctrines as platforms upon which we could build an argument that our students would find compelling. But I don't need to tell you all that most 19 year olds haven't really spent that much time pondering the great doctrines of the church. <clears throat> Um, and I, I think we both found as we were working on the book that while the doctrines of the church and, um, you know, major issues like the creeds, why they were still informing what we were doing, they didn't need to be at the forefront of it. Um, and while I don't want to speak about this at, at great length, I went through a, a period of, of terrific personal reassessment um, of, of illness and in the midst of that period, I was met by God. Um, and what was really powerful for me was, was realizing while working on the book that I wanted the book to reshape the reader. And right around that time, we had realized that there was another way to do it. And that was to use a virtue-based approach. Um, mm -hmm. And so in a period of humility, we wrote about humility. I mean, the, the parallel for me was so helpful. Um, and so while working on humility, we had to ask the question, how do you teach someone humility from a book? Hmm. 
right? So, yeah. so, so, so we, we just started looking around, right? Looking around at, at what the church has to offer. Um, and one of the things that we found that the church has to offer is a tradition of religious art that's really interested in the virtues. Um, and so we, I mean, there were certain touchstones that we knew we wanted to use, right? Like Mary, Mary as one of the great exemplars of humility. And I'm also um, an amateur Dante scholar. So any opportunity to write about, <laughs> about saints and virtues are pretty exciting to me. But while we were trying to, to work out this problem of, you know, how, how do you teach a 19 year old in a writing class about virtues? I just stumbled one day upon a picture that's owned, it's a diptych. So it's a two part picture that's owned by the Philadelphia Museum of Art by um, an, a, a kind of late medieval Ita Italian painter named Benedetto de Bindo. And it, it puts two images side by side and invites their comparison. Um, and one image is of Jerome translating the Bible into Latin. And the other image is an image from this you know, me popular medieval genre of the, the, the Madonna of humility in which Mary is depicted with the child Jesus in a humble posture. So she's seated on the floor close to the ground, right? She's holding him. She's just been reading scripture and, and just the, the embodiment of humility as expressed in these pictures seemed to me the ideal pedagogical vehicle and then here's the thing. Once you put one picture in the book, you can't stop, <laughs> right? I mean, you all understand this. You can't just have a picture on page 20. The reader is now salivating for more beautiful Christian art. And then the, that was when the fun really began. Although it was a, a fun that had dire consequences for dear Jim as my voracious appetite for religious art meant that Jim had to go hunting for permissions, and I mean, the, and the permissions went in all kinds of interesting directions, right? So we got permissions from art museums. Um, the National Gallery of Ireland gave us permission for for an image um, of Saint Jerome. Ebony Magazine gave us permission for a picture of uh, Maya Angelou. Um, you mm. know, so I mean, we, the, the permissions themselves were are, are fascinating case study. Although I can't imagine that Jim wants to revisit it. <laughs> <laughs> it was that was that was that was trying at times, but um, the, the 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 payoff is that it really really the the image uh, by Benedetto de Bindo is key in so many ways because in that image, Jerome is translating the gospel, but he's it, it's because it's a diptych. It's like he's looking through mm -hmm. this text at Mary, um, mm -hmm. who's seated on the ground with the infant Christ. Huh. And, uh, and so um, he's looking at an exemplar. And so um, that diptych became a kind of pattern for us. We wanted our students to mm -hmm. be able to look at exemplars Interesting. in the book. Yep. Um, so that was the first image. And in some ways it kind of set the stage for the, the rationale for the images. Yeah, and, and, and then the other, I, I think a, a fortunate discovery for us in the process was was that we could draw from a variety of images and thereby testify to the depth and complexity of the Christian interaction with writing and the, the virtues worldwide. Um, hmm. So, uh, you know, one, one of the key images of the book is, is a picture of a really important Indian social reformer um, and a vehicle th through which the scriptures reached a, a significant Indian population, the Pandita Ramabai. And we found a picture of her. Um, sorry, I found a picture and then Jim actually figured out the source of um, a, a picture of her in which she is seated in a, 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 a posture that's like a quintessentially Indian scholars posture. And it paired so nicely with earlier pictures that we had shown of saints like Augustine and Jerome in their studies. Um, and, Doing similar and, work. Translating. Yeah, exactly, right? Doing the same work, translating the Bible, right? And, 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 it, and, and it helped us to see that we were really on to something. Um, that, you know, the, saint, the, the, the kind of saints of the early church and of the Western tradition were opening our eyes to the fact that there's these, these continuing trends 
right? A, a set of continuing questions that find expression in various kinds of images and activities worldwide. So I, I, and that's something that, you know, should there be another edition of charitable writing that we wanna build up even further. And we'd really, really like the second edition to be printed with color images, which we couldn't get this time around. But I, I, think, I think the second time around, if we sell enough copies, uh, we, we might make, the, make a superior argument for. Well, we may work on that later tonight. Um, you know, you, kind of in the introduction of the book, you, you talk about writing instruction as involving threshold concepts. And I wonder, you know, and you've mentioned this approach of virtues as being, as being sort of the guiding threshold concepts for the book. Would you talk about the particular uh, threshold concepts around, the, around which the book is organized? Jim, maybe you could start by just explaining the, what writing studies means when they talk about threshold concepts and then lead into ours. Yeah, so um, writing studies right now, um, it, it's one of the big ideas in, in the field um, and that is threshold concepts. And threshold concepts um, are um, ideas that until they're understood and they're often not understood uh, without practice, until they're understood um, you can't really navigate uh, a, a discipline fully. Um, so the example that we uh, give on in, in the book is drawing on earlier work um, on threshold concepts is the notion of imaginary numbers in mathematics. Mm -hmm. um, until you understand uh, the notion of imaginary numbers, um, it, it just doesn't make sense. Um, and but once once you do understand um, that uh, this concept of imaginary numbers, all of these other possibilities become open. Mm. Um, well, uh, writing study says all fields have threshold concepts. Um, and as you encounter them, it, they can be troublesome. Um, they trouble your, your previous views. Um, it can be risky to encounter a threshold concept, but it can really radically transform the way you think about something. So writing studies too has, has threshold concepts. Um, and there's a, there's a fairly recent book called Naming What We Know in the field of writing studies that outlines a number, I think 37 mm -hmm. of these uh, threshold concepts. Uh, so we wanted to take that uh, notion. We, wa we wanted our book to be consistent with um, scholarship in the field of writing studies, but we wanted to also extend it uh, to think about that theologically. Um, so uh, that's, that's where our uh, kind of theological, spiritual threshold concepts come from. And they are uh, humble listening, loving argument, and keeping time hopefully. Hmm. So we organized the book into three sections uh, based on those three threshold concepts. Good writers, we argue, um, listen humbly, argue lovingly, and keep time hopefully. Hmm. Uh, Rick, do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah. So to, to second what Jim said, I, I think that's that's the, the part of the introduction that's the strongest nod to the, con the contemporary kind of state of rhetoric and writing studies. And that's, that was important for us in writing the book that we acknowledge, we know what's going on in the field. Um, but we also thought, what a pregnant image, um, right? That to, to be on the threshold is to be an in-between state. There's been a lot of really fascinating anthropological work about what happens when you're in a threshold condition. Um, and I, I, I just thought that the image spoke so nicely to the condition of the writing student, right? That, that the writing student is often a 19 year old or gosh, think about starting grad school, right? When you're unlearning everything that you thought you knew um, and having to gain an, an entirely new skill set. Um, I remember having my writing taken apart uh, as a first year graduate student and then gradually rebuilt. And of course, now I'm in the process of pretty much shedding all of what I learned in grad school about how to write and <laughs> lear learning anew. And, and I, I like, I just think that the concept of the threshold is really pregnant. And it's also one that's, that has a really vivid correlation to the Christian tradition, right? That we're really interested in doorways, right? Particularly people who knock on your doorway um, uh, or pass it, passing through a doorway on the, on the way to something else. Um, and so the, the threshold worked really nicely for us, both in, in showing the, that we are current with the field, but also, you know, moving towards these kinds of memorable images that speak to life circumstances. And then coming up with our spiritual threshold concepts was just a really joyful translation, right? That we had this really, really great, you know, body of academic work to work with. Yeah. 
right? And we were we were kind of breaking some new ground, right? And suggesting that the threshold concept, which had this great life within writing studies, could also apply to the Christian, specifically Christian academic context, but also just professional context in which, you know, you're you're being challenged to listen in a different way. And then, I mean, it wasn't exactly like a, a virtue matching game, but we did as we were working on the project and the virtue angle became stronger and stronger think to ourselves, all right, well, when you're at the, the beginning stage of a project, right, when you're growing as a student, what's the central virtue at that moment? It never goes away, right? But we thought it's humility. And then, right, we, we, we were not so clever. We didn't come up with this. We then realized that in most early Christian and medieval accounts of the virtues, humility is always understood as the first one, right? That, that, of course, love permeates all of the virtues, but the ancient, the ancient teaching, which if you think about it, is so true to experience, right? That, that requires you to be humbled first. And then humility allows us to um, you know, discover the truth and fullness of love, and then to endure in these things requires hope. Um, and, and the pieces all fit together really nicely, which is good because Jim has a kind of mania for all the pieces fitting together perfectly, <laughs> right? So I, I'm chaos, right? Jim's the Rubik's cube. Um, yeah, I, I like, I like my, my books to be very ordered. And, and, and starting with a threshold concept, right? We, we talk about this at the beginning pages of the book, a book, the opening pages of a book are a threshold. Um, and so the reader is kind of moving into uh, this space with us. And if it's a first year writer, for example, they're moving into the space in a particular kind of way and kind of take them through that and then move toward love and towards this. Great. Oh, I, I, if I could just say really quickly, if we do get to write a second edition, we're gonna add a chapter about courage. Um, Right, that I that that was we at we one of the uh, jumping off points for the book. One of the real catalysts for the book was an essay by a theologian named Stephanie Paulsell, and Stephanie was gracious, and her published was publisher was gracious enough allow uh, allow us to put her book or sorry her essay uh, as an appendix in our book. And she writes really powerfully about courage, the courage to write. Um, and uh, at least when we were kind of formulating our argument. It wasn't that we didn't think courage was important, but we didn't think it was quite as important um, as the other virtues that we were listing. And, and to be perfectly honest, I, at that point, was just wrestling a bit with, with the latent kind of military associations um, that yeah. I have with courage. Um, and I have subsequently come to see uh, that courage is really necessary for writing. Um, and I think that there could be a way to, to write about it productively um, and I also just want to flag that it was a it was a female member of one of my classes who convinced me mm -hmm. that we would need to have um, a chapter about courage, um, and and that it would slot very nicely into some arguments we were already making in the book. Wow. Hey, speaking of courage, I think sometimes uh, argument involves a certain amount of courage, and you write about, a lot about argument. And I, I wanted to uh, uh, explore. You know, you talk about loving argument. That sounds like an oxymoron to me. And um, uh, perhaps uh, you might talk a little bit more about that. And how is it possible to lovingly argue in writing? How do you create uh, a climate of loving argument in your, in your courses? Can I, can I start, Rick? Yes, please. So I'm actually going to take us back to humility. Um, so, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it from the kind of writing studies angle. A psychologist by the name of Carl Rogers um, who has uh, been taken up by the field of writing studies. And he talks, about, um, he talks about listening and he talks about arguing. And uh, one of the things that's really important for him in his kind of method of argumentation is that when two people are um, interlocutors are having an argument, uh, the second person should uh, listen and then recount the first person's arg argument to the first person's satisfaction hmm. before the second person responds. And so that's come to be known as uh, Rogerian argument. And, and, and uh, Bob, you were talking about the climate uh, for argumentation. And that kind of climate is one of the things that's really missing in a lot of the mm -hmm. our, our public and political discourse right now. That willingness to listen, to restate um, to the satisfaction of your quote unquote opponent. Um, but that's that's a kind of starting place, and I actually 
I, um, when I taught the book this semester in my class, I actually had students construct Rogerian arguments in groups. So they had to partner up with two other people uh, around an issue uh, with which there was disagreement among the two or three of them. And then together they had to construct an argument, but they had to do so in a way that satisfied the conditions of Rogerian argument. And hmm. that was what they were graded on collectively. Okay. So trying to teach uh, that kind of notion um, uh, to students, I think is really important. That's the kind of starting place uh, for what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Rick, do you wanna say more? Yeah, I, I have, a, I have a several thoughts. They're a little bit scattered. So uh, if, if I say something that's useful and you all want to return to it at some point, just pull, pull out right, the golden thread from, from the, 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 the mess of, 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 that I'm about to offer to you. Um, but Jim and I both had our first day of teaching today for the semester. So I, I, I'm not pooped exactly, but I'm just a little, I, I feel like a, my thoughts are moving in a lot of directions. Um, the first thing I want to address is um, what I call the instantaneous exception, right? The instantaneous exception, which has been a response that I've, I've seen some people have to the book, right? And I'm talking about friends, right? As we've, as we've worked on the project. And that is to immediately reply when someone says that argument ought to be loving, but what about dot, 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 hmm? right? But what about, but what about, uh, and, and I bring this up because I, I think in some ways we have to be willing to take the risk. Maybe, it's, maybe we need to be courageous enough to imagine the possibility that our Lord's teaching on love is true, that you can love your neighbor as yourself, and that there's no domain of human life in which it is not potentially applicable and in which it cannot potentially be shared even with the person whom you perceive to be your enemy, right? So I think that there are circumstances in which what Jim and I are pitching probably won't work, right? If someone is running at you with a crowbar, I don't I think violence. that's the moment, right? <laughs> right, to say, let's sit down, right? And have a thoughtful <laughs> conversation about how we are proceeding in our debate. Um, yeah. Right, uh, right, uh, right, because because as Jim's saying, right, right, there's a kind of implicit Rogerian structure to the way we're thinking about these things, and in, in which both parties are potentially coming in with the ability to listen. Right, but I think that that there's a way in which there's mutual goodwill. Yeah, mutual goodwill. Right, but I think that there's also a way in which, right, uh, I think our book is in some ways a, a, an attempt to allow us to imagine that our neighbors could have goodwill, even if we are kind of have a predilection to imagine them as antagonists, right? Mm -hmm. That there's this deeply rooted argumentative culture and our, our argumentative uh, schema in our culture that dates back to the Greeks and Romans. And it's gonna be really hard for us to get it out of our brains. But I think it's possible for us to imagine that when we come to the argument with goodwill and hopes of, of, of offering and receiving love, the other person can join us there. So it's easiest to do in the context of people who have already established that they have goodwill towards one another. But I also think that maybe the courage angle comes in and thinking, I can bring love into this quarter of my life, this part of my work, right? Which isn't saying that I, you know, I'm just necessarily gonna agree with everyone or assume everyone's gonna agree with me. We're still making arguments. Um, so I just would, I would bring this forward just as I think like part of what the project is trying to do is just even imagine that love applies, right? To go to Bob's point, right? That it's not an oxymoron, but a paradox in which as we think about these things, we realize that what was seems contradictory could in fact be true. Okay, then this is the, the, the more practical point that I wanted to make. In our academic lives, um, I think especially as, as students are maturing, um, be it as undergraduate or graduate students, um, they become good at demolishing arguments and, and advancing a certain kind of rhetorical skepticism, um, which seems really appealing because it dem demonstrates a certain kind of mastery, right? That I understand this person's argument well enough that I can mock its weaknesses um, or I can establish my own dominance. Like, look at me, right? I used to be a pipsqueak and now I'm, I'm, a, I'm an adult. I'm gonna flex my intellectual muscles and in showing you you know, why this, this article published in a major journal 
right, really is so terrifically flawed. Um, and I think that's where the Christian academic really needs to consider what our obligations are, right, to our, our field, to our colleagues, right, to our neighbors. Um, and there, I think the teaching, right, our teaching about loving argument means not that you pretend that you agree, right, but rather that you present other people's arguments in the light, best possible light, in the way that they would want their arguments to be um, uh, constructed and construed before you go to the important work of offering critique, right? So we're not, we're not opposed to critique, right? Jim and I offer critique to one another all the time, right? I might have strong feelings about Jim's sweater, um, right? And I probably will tell him. Um, Jim might adore my bow tie, as he'd be right to do. But, but all, all the same, um, right? We, we've, we really have become convinced that we have to get out of the business of making straw men and women right, out of our, our peers in our writing, and we need to embrace a vision that we need to, we need to love other people who have contributed to our disciplines by giving their arguments the best possible shape and then responding with respect, right, which includes critique. Um, yeah. So I'll, we can, I'll, I'll, yeah. Well, I was just gonna say, I think, I think the, our book wants to imagine that we can do our academic work really well, right, with sophistication well, and demonstrating expertise, and also treat our colleagues as neighbors. And speaking of that book, we're gonna take, we'll take some time out and do a commercial here. Um, we uh, do wanna highlight um, the book, Charitable Writing, uh, uh, which is authored by uh, Richard and James uh, and uh, uh, if you're intrigued with some of the ideas that they're talking about, uh, uh, about how, is this really possible uh, to do? Is it possible to teach students to do that? Whether we teach writing or we teach in other areas that engage involve writing, uh, this is a great book. I I thoroughly enjoyed both the art and the ideas, the virtues. Um, the humility, the uh, loving, and particularly the waiting and uh, waiting and hope uh, aspect of it, uh, uh, particularly in some of the long haul kinds of things that are involved in writing. Um, so we have it for discount right now uh, with InterVarsity Press. Uh, for anybody who's on the call, uh, you can get the book at 30% off. Uh, directly from InterVarsity Press. Um, we'll put these things in the chat, uh, but the URL is uh, 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 there. And uh, just use GFM Web 21 when you check out and your book will be discounted 30%. So we hope, uh, hope you'll pick up the book. Uh, uh, believe me, we've been just able to get to a sliver of the good stuff that's uh, found in there. Uh, so with that, we're going to go. We're going to go to some question and answer time, and um, we had a couple already in the chat. And I'd invite people to go ahead and put. Uh, the chat uh, is happening. I just discovered. Wow. The chat, the chat is happening. We do have some things in the chat, and uh, one of the first questions that came up was uh, from John, who asks. Uh, Does your analysis engage at all with Peter Elbow's concepts of the doubting and believing games, which um, I have no idea what it, you might explain that for some of us who are not uh, writing teachers, but uh, uh, yeah. Go so ahead, go ahead, James. James is on this one. Hmm? So we don't talk about the believing and doubting game uh, specifically in the book. For those of you who aren't uh, familiar with it, Elbow basically says that. Um, we can respond to arguments in two ways. We ought to practice this. Um, we should look at arguments and try to believe them and try to construct um, essentially steel person arguments uh, to use our, some of our language from mm -hmm. steel person arguments mm -hmm. on behalf of them. And then we should also play the, that's the believing game, right? Mm -hmm. And then we should also play the doubting game where we uh, try to be as skeptical as we can about these things as we're developing arguments as of our own in order to mm -hmm. give them a kind of full hearing. Um, so it's a really nice heuristic, I would say, uh, for thinking about um, our response to argumentation. Although we don't um, engage it specifically, we're, we're essentially advocating for a kind of believing game yeah. um, in, uh, in, uh, the, 
in the, in the book, especially when we talk about Rogerian argument and uh, kind of listening really well um, mm -hmm. when others are speaking. So it definitely resonates uh, with what we're talking about in the book, although we don't talk about it specifically. I, I'll just, I'll add um, uh, to what Jim said. First of all, thank you for the question. I, I, I think it's yeah, a, a helpful and astute one. Um, I'll just add even the notion of the student's vocation as being playful to me is productive. Um, uh, it, working with students, so my, my background uh, educationally was uh, you know, secular institutions all the way through. Um, so I, I had some uh, experiences while I was an undergrad in a grad school visiting um, religious campuses. I spent a, a summer in a program at Notre Dame. While I was in grad school, I, I did some coursework at Duke Divinity School, but um, I, I like the Christian academic world was really new to me when I started working at Wheaton. And one of the issues that I came across with my students at Wheaton was their belief that they couldn't write unless they were confident and certain of what they believed, right? So every single paper needed to be an expression of their most heartfelt convictions about whatever topic it was, and in all likelihood, a topic upon which they had never thought for more than four or five seconds, um, <laughs> right? And so with those students, I, I've learned that part of my responsibility as a mentor is to help them to see that writing and verbal argument in the best possible sense are modes of thinking and discovery. So I like where I phrase it for my students um, in my classes is that the classroom itself is a playful rhetorical space in which students can advance views tentatively in order to understand the strength of those views and potential coherence of those views, right? So I tell them you are free from having to own this view. You don't have to own it. You could just try it out. Let's try it together, right? And if somebody else has a really good idea, that person can share that idea with you and you can build off of it. Um, now we're starting to move towards the, the metaphor, metaphorical frameworks that, that Bob has found so exciting about the book, right? And I, I, I find it exciting too. I mean, we, we have our own metaphor, but we're really building off the work of other people who've realized when we think about argument in the West, we conceive of it as either a really competitive football game or a, a war, right? For the most part, when we talk about argument, we're talking about shooting people down. We're talking about erecting defenses, right? Right. We're talking about being killed by other people, right? He just killed me in that debate today, right? He just assaulted my argument. He undermined it, right? There's so much violence in the way that we imagine argument and, and like gestures like bringing an elbow and saying, look, this is a game, right? And, it, and you can play the game for a while. And when you're done with the game, let's see where, you, where, where things fall out, right? Jim and I also really like the idea of a barn raising, um, which was a, a, a concept that suggested by these, were they, they're educational professors, right? McCormick and Kahn, um, right? The suggestion that, hey, when an Amish community needs to build a new barn, everybody comes together. Right? They pool resources, they pool manpower and woman power and up goes the barn. Right? And then the next time it's your turn and, and the whole community comes over and builds the barn. How about thinking about a seminar like that or the construction of an argument as being like that? Right? Other people can help you mm -hmm. right? and, and, and you can tweak what they offer you and nobody needs to claim ultimate possession while we're building arguments. And then once the argument's up, we get to assess, okay, is it sturdy? Do you really wanna live there? Right? Maybe not. We, we can play for a while before we get to that point. Hmm? Hmm. That, that, sounds, that sounds good. Uh, I, I like the idea of play rather than war. Um, mm. uh, let's see, one of the, uh, Crystal asked a good question. That's oh one, man, Crystal, good question. Yeah, what, what do you think are the most common mistakes made by Christians who write on contemporary issues? Ooh. James? <laughs> 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 well, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I have a few probably, probably have a few answers to that question. Yeah. Um, I do, I do think that we, we do tend to be in our own, uh, bubbles, uh, yeah. pretty extensively. And so, um, that can hamper our understanding of particular issues. Um, and, and so, 
the, the antidote for that is to read outside of the spheres that we curate for ourselves. Um, yeah. So that's, that's one, that's one kind of issue. Well, I, Jim, I want you to keep going, but can I just add on there? I think it's really important for people who are working with young people to model how that works for them. Yeah. Right. Cause we all know, right. When you encounter people who perceive the world in a different way than you, than you do, it's threatening. Right. So to say, Hey students, like I also read that periodical, right. Right. And, and here's why I read it. Right. And here's some of the value that I found in it, but I also right, right. We know each other, right? We, we know that we share core convictions, um, right? So, so rather than just like kind of sending people off, I think part of our responsibility as, as educators is to show students how that process might work. Okay, Jim, please keep going. That, that, yeah, thank you. And, and um, then I would say that, you know, so many of the issues that get talked about by Christians in the, in the public sphere are politicized. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and and so we just need to do a better job of thinking and talking about how we establish common ground, how we mm -hmm. find what's an issue in a given debate. I, I talk about stasis theory in my writing classes, finding out what's an issue mm -hmm. in a given debate and, and, and looking for common ground, looking for points of agreement, seeking understanding rather than victory. So important. So it really shifts the terms uh, or the objectives of any uh, conversation. Um, and so, w when when our arguments get co-opted uh, for for particular political purposes, I think that can be just um, just deadly uh, for our a witness uh, in the public square. Um, and so, I think you know to the extent that we can you know, extricate ourselves from some of some of those. Um, structures that that's that's helpful well so um you know i i I've, I've been thinking about this problem too so i'm i'm grateful um for this question because uh i've concluded in the last few years that i um i can't just write within the ivory tower i, I i'm such a true blue academic i would really like to just have an office at an archive it would be fine with me if I saw old books and my family. That, that would really be sufficient. And then maybe every 10 years, there could be an article about Dante that comes out. But really, it's just me and the manuscripts down there. Uh, but I've realized that, uh, I, that's, that, that my vocation demands more of me. Um, and so you know, for the last few years, I've been, I've been writing for the Hedgehog Review. I write regularly for the Hedgehog Review blog. Um, I had a piece come out last week, last week called A History Lesson from Alexander Hamilton um, that was my attempt to respond to the siege of the Capitol. Uh, and while I was writing it, I kept thinking to myself, am I writing charitably? So my first bit of advice, right, my, or the mistake I make is that I think in some sense we, we don't feel the... Uh, the, the bridle or the yoke of the Lord sufficiently. We, sh we, should ha we should be thinking twice all the time while we're trying to do this, um, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't. That's why courage is so important to me right now is I, I, think we, I think we have to have the courage to speak if we've been given platforms and, and frankly have the giftedness to do it. Um, and then this goes to my second point. Oh, I also have a piece coming out tomorrow on the Hedgehog Review blog about unity um, about the meaning of unity within the context of a republic. Um, and, and, and what I've, what I've particularly been learning over the last few months is I think Christians may make the mistake of not having good editors, right? And this is my, this is really my concern about blog culture in general, um, is, is that it's really too easy. It's too easy to just get something up on the internet while the blood is up. Um, so the way I think about it now is, uh, I, 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 you have to have somebody else, a wise person read what you wrote and offer critique before it goes out. Um, right. So, so this is counterintuitive, but I think we need to, to, to create friction, right? So if, if blogs, um, and social media tend to be frictionless environments where you can just type your 140 plus characters and, and get it out immediately, which is 
strangely satisfying, um, maybe more satisfying than it should be, certainly isn't healthy for us, but right, that, that we should seek out trusted editors. Um, and that doesn't mean it has to be a professional editor, um, but just somebody else has to look at it before it goes out, if you wanna comment on contemporary issues. And um, it's gotta be somebody who doesn't see everything exactly the same way you do. Um, so it shouldn't be your best friend or your spouse or your brother, although those are all complicated relationships in lots of different ways. So at Hedgehog, I've been really grateful um, to work with some fantastic editors who've got great journalistic backgrounds. Um, and they, they have not exactly um, hold, held the press on some things I've written, uh, uh, but I mean, sign they've significantly revised. I mean, we're talking like lopping paragraphs off, rewriting sentences, like key sentences, taking away images that I wanted to use because as you said, rhetorically, it's not gonna resonate, right? Or you're gonna alienate readers left and right. Um, and, and this is something we, we talk about in the book. Uh, we, we, we set up the book talking about writing as a social practice. Yes. And, th and this, is, this is just speaking to, uh, Richard, you're speaking to that, um, that, that point really well, right? Mm -hmm. So at the, the editor is part of that social, that social practice of writing. There's a, there's, a, there's a vignette by Alan Jacobs also that we talk about uh, yep. that, uh, in the book um, about a moment that he felt he had to pause and, and, and not respond. Yeah, um, and, and that can be a really important move as well mm. to say, I cannot respond at this moment to this problem. I need to give yep. it some time um, and thought. Yeah, and you know, as we all try really hard to conform our imaginations to the mind of God, I think it will become easier for us to see what we're doing as something mm -hmm. that's important to our discipleship, expression of our servanthood, but also just minuscule and radically contingent. Um, so I think, I think we actually can mis mistake what we're doing in it, like a, a, on what paradoxically as both being of the utmost importance and maybe not of, a, of significant importance. Um, and and I, I just have this hope, this is the hope I have for myself and, and maybe some of you all will share it. So I'm not putting this on you, I'm offering this to you as just some, a, re a reflection I've had since writing the book. I don't think you can be a culture warrior if you're not at war. Um, Right, so the way I think about the, the kind of writing I've been doing in more public spaces about contemporary issues is like, I wanna be a peacemaker, um, right? That doesn't mean that I'm agreeing with everyone all the time, but it does mean that I have to find out as Jim was saying, like what's been, what people been arguing on from the various political stripes. So, so we're, when working on this piece about unity, that's gonna go up on the Hedgehog website tomorrow. I, I, I just found it really helpful to read people writing on both the left and the right. Right, so Michael Gerson showed me some things this week, and so did a guy named Richard Kreitner writing for The Nation. And and you know, The Nation is not happy uh, that the vaccine right now um, with a lot of things. So it's really helpful. To, and and I learned something from both of them. Uh, hmm. That doesn't mean that everybody of all political stripes is going to like what I write. I think a lot of people will see what I'm doing as um, maybe too hopeful and naive. Um, but we'll see. I want to be a peacemaker. Hmm? Hey, we have another question I want to get to. Um, Anna, Anna has asked, um, well, she makes a great observation that writing is thinking. I often don't know what I think until I write. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, do you draw upon Martha Nussbaum at all? Classical argument, liberal education, cosmopolitanism, uh, worthiness of mutual dignity and respect. Oh, yeah. Jim, why don't you start? I, I want to see if I can find that quote from Augustine. Yeah, we, uh, we don't mention uh, Nussbaum's work um, in the book uh, explicitly, but I think, um, again, uh, some of what she's talking about in terms of the importance of our uh, emotions uh, to, um, and, and virtue to um, our interactions with one another um, is, resonates nicely with what we're, what we're saying in the book. I, I can't find it. I mean, I should know. We wrote it. Um, what are you looking for? I, I was just looking for the bit where we talk about um, uh, Christians making the claim, right? We, we write to know what we think. Um, yeah, yeah. Right. So, I mean, Christians have been making that argument for a really long time, right? That we write to know what we think. Um, I, I'll say this about Nussbaum. Um, gosh, I would love to write something in response to Nuss Nussbaum. I've always wanted to write something in response to Love's Knowledge. So I just, I'll just say thank you for the invitation and yeah, we'll do it at some point. Yeah. Um, I think she's such an important contemporary figure. 
um, particularly for the fact that that she has mastered, right? She has come to know with with uh, incredible sophistication so much of the tradition out of which the key Christian intellectual figures of the early church were working. Um, so she's a conversation partner for us. I mean, you know, Alan has has responded to a number of her arguments in in his more theological books, and um, I think she's such a helpful person to be reading in general now. Her 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 essay, "Can Patriotism Be Compassionate?" Um, it was published, I think, in the Nation. Mm. I'm sure, is is still so so relevant. What yeah. twenty years uh, yep. twenty years on, um, talking about the us versus them. Yep. Um, um, that uh, um, situation that's often set up in our in our public discourse. Yeah. Well, and I, I think I think I think the word respect is hopefully rather not so much I think as much as I hope that the word respect um, gets gets more uh, more dynamism behind it in the next couple of years. There, there's a, a a kind of what do you call it? The, kind of an old, an old school technology and society political scientist named Langdon Winner. He wrote a book um, that came out in the early '80s called the what is it called the um, the Whale and the Reactor. Um, and he the University of Chicago Press just put out a new edition. It's a really classic book if you're interested in um, kind of the policy and theory of technology. So not just like you know, is technology good or bad, but just like, how does, how does our thinking about technology shape us and our response, particularly to the environment? The, the, the Whale and the Reactor is a great book. And, it, and even though several of the chapters are now decades old, because he wrote it uh, gradually, it still really resonates. But anyway, he wrote a, a new last chapter um, and, and he, he has some, some interest in, in kind of restoring respect, right? On the grounds of respect, although he comes at it um, with Hannah Arendt as his kind of guru. Hey, I, I'm going to give you a question and ask you to try to give me a one sentence response. We just have about a moment left. Um, what advice would you offer for those who, who like you come to a realization that the classes you teach as Christians are virtually indistinguishable from those mm -hmm. that others teach? And uh, so what would your advice be? Uh, uh, to folks who conclude that and realize this probably isn't the, shouldn't be the case. Rick, you want me to go first? Or you want to yeah. go first? Yeah, you go ahead, go first. Um, I, th I think, uh, first of all, I, I would just go echo or go back to uh, Richard's point about courage. Um, so, you know, Parker Palmer, The Courage to Teach. I, I really think that there is something um, important about taking risks, uh, risks pedagogically. Um, and mm -hmm. when we lean into uh, those risks, um, it can, there can just be tremendous joy. I, um, working on this project with Richard has been a, an incredible joy um, professionally for me. Um, and, in some ways, you know, it was um, it was a risky endeavor, um, but it, it it was it was incredibly uh, rewarding to think through these problems, to take time to think through these problems. Um, the value of doing it together sounds like an important one. Well, that and that was one of the that was one of the great joys of it. We we had a little cafe about a mile from our college uh, that we would go to. We we had a table where we would write. Uh, together. Sometimes we were working on the same document. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we were working on different documents, uh, but it became uh, an occasion to just um, think and converse with one another. And there was a lot of joy to that. Um, so there can be joy in that, in that particular journey. Um, and then, you know, the, this isn't one sentence, Bob, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm try I want to give Richard a shot here, actually. Oh, Richard, go. Wait, so the assignment is one sentence? Yeah. yeah, Bob, you know, I don't work in one sentence increments. It just, it, it's not who I am, but I can give you a paragraph. Well, okay? you guys, you guys could write long sentences. That's true. <laughs> Comma, <laughs> semicolon, colon, um, right, ellipsis. Uh, but I, I so, so the, the, the question really is about what, what happens in those moments of reframing? Um, 
So I, I think this issue was stronger for me than, than for Jim because of the fact that, you know, Jim, Jim was educated at the college where we work. So I don't think I quite knew I had a problem until I'd been working at Wheaton for a few years and, and, and just saw that my writing classes in particular, they just didn't have the spirit. They just didn't. Um, and yeah. I, I wasn't sure what was going on until I had a moment of reflection in which I realized my imagination had been so strongly framed by my graduate experiences that I just couldn't imagine doing anything else, right? That, that it was easy to pawn it off as, you know, a kind of fidelity to the best standards of the discipline, but really the issue was that my mind needed to be renewed. So my advice honestly is to start with prayer and then my second bit of advice is to find friends. Right, so, so Jim and I did this together. And if, if it hadn't been for Jim, I wouldn't have written this book, right? I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't have had the courage to do it on my own. So um, I, I think that the Lord is waiting to be discovered in all kinds of, of fascinating and unexpected places. Um, and he met us in our writing classroom. Great, well, one more time, we will wanna encourage people uh, to pick up charitable writing. We did put the uh, information about that in the chat and it can be ordered at a 30% discount at University Press. Use the discount code GFMWeb21. Uh, we wanna let you know about our next conversation uh, coming up uh, next month. Uh, we're gonna talk about public intellectuals and the common good. Uh, I think one of the real challenges is how do Christians speak into the public arena? It's kind of a continuation in some ways of some of the things we've been talking about. And there's a new book uh, that's just come out, a co-edited book uh, with a number of contributions, and you'll recognize some of the names. Mm -hmm. um, Jerry Patton Gale, one of the uh, co-editors of the book, is going to be with us uh, next month and uh, February 18th, 2021. This will be a noontime, Eastern time gathering. Uh, and uh, you, the registration is open at tinyurl.com uh, front slash public intellect, and we'll put that in the chat. So, um, uh, uh, so it invites you to participate. Um, sorry here, uh, going too fast through my slides here. Finally, um, we just want to say thanks a lot for being with us today. Uh, uh, I want to thank. Uh, Richard and James uh, for just a great discussion. Uh, thanks to I InterVarsity Press for their partnership. Thanks to all of you for joining us and helping make it a conversation and some of the great questions and comments. Hmm. And uh, uh, we do wanna mention, this has been brought to you by the Emerging Scholars Network, which is an effort to uh, work with aspiring Christian scholars from the time they're undergrads through early career faculty and to encourage them in their scholarly journey. Uh, you can join us for free at blog.emergingscholars.org. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at ESNIVCF. And uh, we have a YouTube channel where we keep all of these videos. Uh, this one will probably be uploaded in the next day or so to that channel. And uh, just a reminder, uh, we're going to stop recording in a moment. And uh, uh, we invite anybody who wants to learn a little bit more about possibly writing for ESN, who'd like to try out some of these things, uh, ideas about charitable writing. We'd love for you to stick around and our uh, uh, blog editor, uh, Hannah Eagleson, will share a little bit about writing for us. Uh, she's a great editor to work with. I've had her edit my stuff and uh, I thoroughly appreciate her talents and uh, it's just a great experience working with somebody who makes your writing better. And so with that, we're gonna go ahead and end the recording. Uh, thanks again, uh, James and Richard, and uh, um, uh, anybody who can uh, would like to stay with us, 